Welcome to the Georgia Archives June Lunch and Learn program. I'm Penny Cliff, Education Specialist here at the Georgia Archives. Our presentation today is Cobb County's Commuter Railroad, the Atlanta Northern Railway with author Todd DeFeo. Todd has studied railroads since growing up alongside the Northeast Corridor Line in New Jersey. He is editor of railfanning.org and founder of the DeFeo Group. Today, he lives near the historic Western and Atlantic Railroad. He's written several railroad histories, including the first ever complete histories of the Memphis, Clarksville and Louisville, and the Indiana, Alabama and Texas Railroads. We're so glad that you joined us. Welcome, Todd. Sorry. Uh, no, just pull it off. Oh, there you go. Perfect. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. I'm particularly excited to be talking about the Atlanta Northern Railway. So I have a pretty little short presentation today about the, the line. And my favorite part of any presentation is the opportunity to take questions. I'd like to give a caveat at the beginning. I'm always happy to take questions and give an answer. They may or may not be accurate. Before I jump too far into the presentation today, I'd be remiss if I didn't take a moment to say how important the Georgia Archives is and the many stories that it holds within its walls. I visited, I visited the archives twice while writing my book on the Atlanta Northern, and the information I gathered here was indispensable to the story. What's fascinating about researching railroads is that often there's a distinct lack of facts. It sounds funny. What happened happened and it should be undeniable. But history has a funny way of obscuring the past. Official records sometimes lack clarity. Newspaper accounts may be unreliable. People's recollections are hazy. But that's what makes telling a story such a fun challenge to tackle. As I begin my presentation today, I wanted to start with a story about a catastrophe that transpired on the railroad. It was an event that I researched here at the archives. Perhaps now is also the time to mention that I have a knack for beginning or ending my presentations on a macabre note. To set it up, I want to turn back the clock to the morning of January 2nd, 1928. On that day, two trolleys, the Joseph E. Brown and the Lemuel P. Grant, collided. Both trolleys, of course, were named for famous Georgians, and they crashed in the Jonesville community. If you're familiar with Cobb County, and then specifically the area between Smyrna and Marietta, Jonesville was a community located along Atlanta Road, more or less at the end of Dobbins runway today. Ultimately, six people were killed in the tragedy, but rather than focus on it from a railroad operation perspective and talk about the ensuing investigation and who was responsible, I wanted to use the crash as a window into the era and talk about the people who depended on the Atlanta Northern Railway. The six people who were killed in the wreck should be remembered, even if history has largely forgotten them. The six people who died range in age from 33 years old to 50 years old. They lived in Atlanta and Marietta and in and around Smyrna. Meyer Lutzk and Louis Melender were merchants. Elmira White and Carrie McIntyre were housewives. Everett Moon and George Hudson worked for either the Atlanta Northern or its parent company, a small little outfit that we know today as Georgia Power. As an aside, you can find the six people killed in the wreck in historic cemeteries across the metro Atlanta area, including Oakland Cemetery. But there are others involved in the wreck. They range in age from 15 years old to their mid 50s. They were school teachers, mill workers, truckers, farmers, greenhouse workers, and many more. They were brought together at a moment in time. They are a part of history and the Atlanta Northern story. You see, a railroad is more than the rolling stock and the tracks. It's a story about communities, 
It's a story about mobility. And it's ultimately a story about people. And sometimes it's a story about tragedy. And it's about how tragedy strikes and in a sheer bit of callousness, the world moves on and we forget those stories. We forget the people. Sometimes we even forget the places where these tragedies happen. Just consider Jonesville. I think it's fair to say few people today know of this community nearly lost the history. From the railroad perspective, the Atlanta Northern took the wrecking stride, sadly. It was a cost of doing business, a literal cost, in that they paid the victims of the wreck and it eventually fell from the headlines. To give you an insight into how the Atlanta Northern viewed it, a VP of the company sent a letter to the insurance company shortly after the wreck and said, if there could be anything fortunate about the accident, it consists in the fact that all of the dead and injured belong to the middle class. There being none of the high earning capacity or more than ordinary standing in the respective communities where they live. Rather coldly put. But I share this story and this quote in particular because it highlights the intersection of an institution like the Atlanta Northern and the people it served. Now, before we go too much deeper into the story, I wanted to give you a little bit of context about the Atlanta Northern and the time that it ran. The railroad began service in July of 1905, and it operated between downtown Atlanta and the Marietta Square, and it ran until early 1947. You can see the Jonesville tragedy on there in 1928. Shortly after that, the Great Depression came along. The Atlanta Northern survived the Great Depression. It exited into the World War II era. And it emerged as a vital transportation link. But ultimately, by the time we got to World War II, the best days of the Atlanta Northern were behind it. And in quintessential Atlanta fashion, we opted for the motor vehicle, the enemy of the Atlanta Northern throughout its four decades of operation. In presentations about this line, I usually talk about the notion of commuter rail or mass transit. People will often say or ask a question, maybe one day Cobb County will have a mass transit option. When will we have more trains in Cobb County? And if you can believe it, once upon a time, the area actually had two options. We're talking about the Atlanta Northern today, but it also had the Western and Atlantic Railroad. I think it's probably safe to assume that more people have heard of the Western and Atlantic. The state-owned railroad is still there, running between Atlanta and Chattanooga, Tennessee. But paralleling that line is the line we're going to be focusing on today. It was the Atlanta Northern, and it operated for four decades. Now, some of the stops changed over the years, and there were changes to a specific route, but it generally followed what we know today as Atlanta Road. It passed through cities such as Smyrna, but it also served many smaller communities, such as Jonesville, like I mentioned a moment ago, Fair Oaks, Gilmore, Vinings, Bolton. Some of these communities barely exist anymore. They've been subsumed by urban sprawl and the growth of Atlanta, Smyrna, and Marietta in particular. And as I alluded to a moment ago, the line competed with automo automobile traffic and had constant run-ins with motor vehicles and jitneys throughout its history. At times, these run-ins caused serious consternation to the, officials, to the officials at the Atlanta Northern. And that was clearly the case on January 14th, 1925. So if we can imagine, it's a cold January morning, and you're one of about 1,500 commuters who shows up to catch the morning streetcar in the town. And instead of finding a streetcar rumbling down the tracks, you see a notice hanging on the streetcar stop. And it said, the line has closed. Think about it, 1925, not everybody had a car. We didn't have Uber, so we couldn't flag down a rideshare vehicle. 
how are you supposed to get to your job? Perhaps you could turn to the Western Atlantic Railroad, but it illustrated the importance of a line like the Atlanta Northern. It really was a vital transportation link, and its cessation of service was a real problem. But that's precisely what happened on this morning, January 14, 1925. Why would the line take such a drastic action? I've never run a railroad myself, but I can imagine if you're trying to have customer service, this is not the right way to go about it. Well, the Atlanta Northern said unfair bus competition on lines paralleling car tracks had forced abandonment of schedules. Another way we could put that is there was too much competition from these newfangled buses and the Atlanta Northern the officials threw up their arms and said, we're not going to run our streetcars anymore. But it was more than just not running streetcars. Atlanta Northern workers cut the overhead trolley wire. They tore up a section of tracks and all the trainmen working on the line were assigned to sister lines. They had shut down the line. Did they really have a point for taking this drastic action? Like every argument throughout history, it depends on whose perspective it is. But ultimately, it was due to something that Preston Arkwright, the president of the Atlanta Northern said was the degradation of the automobile, the jitney. You see, in the 1920s, what was happening in this era was the rise of the automobile and road improvements. And streets like Atlanta Road were starting to be paved. And in Atlanta, there was this huge showdown between the streetcars and the jitneys. Now a jitney is essentially somewhere between a taxi and a bus. It's more or less an open air taxi that maybe should have five or 10 people in it, but probably carry 20 or 30 people in it. So there are more people riding in it than probably should have. And in short, the Atlanta Northern's concerns came down to street repairs. Their perspective was we're paying a lot of money in taxes and franchise fees. And cities and counties are using this money to improve the streets. Then what happens? Our competition comes in, uses these streets. They're benefiting from our improvements, but they're not paying the same taxes. It's just not very fair. It sounds a lot like the fight that we have today or have had in recent years between taxis and ride sharing companies. Taxis are a long standing means of transportation. Suddenly there's new technology comes on and we can have something like Uber or Lyft. And then the taxi companies complain. Their competitors aren't saying the same taxes. They don't have the same insurance regulations and requirements. In other words, they're held to a different standard. And it was the same argument in 1925, which should go to show you that history really does repeat itself. And if we don't learn from the past, we will definitely repeat it. And this fight really came down to two people. Newt Morris and Preston Arkwright. I mentioned Preston Arkwright a moment ago. He was the president of the Atlanta Northern. Newt Morris was an attorney in Marietta. Newton Augustus Morris, Judge Morris, as he was usually known. We could spend days discussing Newt and his history. He was born in 1869. He was a native of Cherokee County, went to the University of Georgia. He was prominent in democratic politics, played a role in the Leo Frank lynching, served as a speaker of the Georgia House of Representatives. He was a judge, hence the name Judge Morris. But in his capacity as a lawyer, he had several run-ins over the years with the Atlanta Northern. But when the Atlanta Northern stopped running streetcars, he elevated his fight. He filed a lawsuit. And what ultimately happened was an incredible turn of events. One that really illustrates the power that a company like the Atlanta Northern had over local communities. Now we still see this happen today when you think of companies moving in or making demands for tax breaks and certain benefits to relocate a company there or to expand their facilities. 
But this is exactly what happened in 1925. At first, the Marietta Chamber of Commerce tried to persuade the Atlanta Northern to resume its service. Morris was on the board of the Chamber of Commerce, so he stymied those efforts. And ultimately, Atlanta Northern officials said they wouldn't operate their streetcars unless they had assurances from city officials to bar buses from operating on streets where the Atlanta Northern did. That seems like a pretty big demand when you think about it. Dear city, please eliminate the competition. Shows the power the Atlanta Northern had because city officials gave in and gave the railroad what it wanted. They stepped in, passed an ordinance, barring bus operations on the same streets as streetcars. And largely behind this effort was a gentleman I mentioned a moment ago, Preston Stanley Arkwright, born in Savannah, 1871. He too was a lawyer. He married the daughter of a former Georgia governor, Alfred H. Colquitt. And he was the head, starting in 1902, of this small little outfit, the Georgia Railway and Power Company, and several of its successor companies over the years. He held the post until May of 1945 and died the following year. Oh yeah, I should mention those successor companies over the years. That's what we know today as Georgia Power. Now, I mentioned this fight between Jitneys and the Atlanta Northern that spanned months. Ultimately, the Atlanta Northern won the fight and it resumed its service. And Arkwright, for his part, might have viewed the fight as one of the hits that the railroad would have to take as part of its operation. Consider what he said in January 13th, 1925, that same year, in a speech before the retail food dealers of Atlanta. Now in the service of the community, that is just the job we do with the street railroad. There's nothing spectacular about it. There's nothing brilliant about it. There's nothing generous in it. There is no flash about it. It is there every day and night, week in and week out, year after year, performing the work of necessity for the community. And like everyone else who does that kind of job, we don't get the rewards out of it. Certainly, a contentious legal fight was not a reward that Arkwright or anyone at the Atlanta Northern would have wanted. But remember that notion of in the service of the community, because what I want to do next delve a little bit deeper into the Atlanta Northern and the idea of community. When we look at this area today, I think we tend to forget that there were individual communities up and down the line. It today is more or less urban sprawl between Atlanta and Marietta. It's all developed. And I think maybe we think of the agriculture that used to be here and the, and the agriculture, the farms, in that type of industry, but we don't tend to think of some of the heavier industry that was in the area over the years. But I wanted to just call out two of them that were really integral to this area. The first is the Glover Machine Works. This is a locomotive builder that produced 200 steam locomotives in the early 20th century. And if you want to delve deeper into the Glover's history, you should check out the Southern Museum in Kennesaw. They have the company's records and artifacts. Full disclosure, I'm on the board of the museum, but it is a fascinating company to explore. The other is the Bell Bomber plant. And that was the plant that emerged during World War II. They built the B-29 aircraft that helped the country win World War II. But I delved a little bit deeper to get into Preston Arkwright's thinking about who the writer of the Atlanta Northern was and who their communities were that they served. And he went around and would give a lot of speeches to different civic organizations in the 1920s in particular. And in 1922, ironically, he spoke to the Atlanta Automobile Association. And he summed up the persona of the streetcar rider, saying, the rider is generally unable to own an automobile. He is made up from the less wealthy class of the community. He makes no use of the pavement. And yet he's compelled to pay for it. So even a few years before the, the showdown with the Jitneys, he was talking about being compelled to pay for it and pay for pavement that the writer's not using. 
I mentioned at the beginning the notion of mobility. And we, I think today we tend to take mobility for granted. But the people in 1925 surely didn't take mobility for granted. And a rail link such as the Atlanta Northern helped open the suburbs for development. I mentioned a few minutes ago this notion or the question about Cobb County and a mass transit system. And I find it so fascinating when we look back and we realize what we had, something like a mass transit system, that people didn't always take it in the numbers that perhaps we think they did. I pulled together a slide that really illustrated Atlanta Northern ridership numbers. On the far left of this is right around the time that the line started. And you can see the numbers went up steadily until about 1920. And then in 1920, the numbers started to dip. 1920, almost a full decade before the Great Depression. And certainly by 1930, the numbers continued to go down until about 1933. Then they started to come up again modestly. But they, they never really rose to that level again until we hit 1941 and 1942, 1943, World War II. What I think when you look at this chart, we look, we talked a moment ago in 1925 with the rundown with jitneys, is you can really see how automobiles, when they came on the scene and all these road improvements were taking place, it caused a direct downward decline of ridership. So only the continued decline in the 1930s is understandable concerning the Great Depression. But even in this decade, the threats from buses continued to grow. And as I showed a moment ago, the ridership continued to decrease. And the Atlanta Northern even looked at converting its line for use for motor coaches. There were several bus companies that explored operations in the area. And there was one gentleman in particular who was pretty aggressive about it. His name was J.C. Steinmetz. Hang on to that name for a minute. But even in this era, the Atlanta Northern grew suspicious of competing bus operations. They thought they were somehow cheating the, the rules and regulations that were there. And they even ran some undercover operations to see if they could catch them in the act. But ultimately, whether it was the competition or any other headwinds, one of the biggest complaints that Atlanta Northern officials had throughout the history of the line was that the railroad didn't make a lot of money. So I made a similar chart to the ridership chart a moment ago and put in their annual revenues. And you can really see it bring to life how well the railroad did. Some years it did fairly well, but even by 1910, it had already a year in the red. It went back up again. And in the 1920s, even though the ridership numbers had gone down, you could see actually the revenue numbers were, were a little bit better, but they still declined and certainly by the 1930s. The railroad was in a perilous financial shape. But much like the ridership numbers, you can see by the end of the 1930s and into the 1940s, the numbers continued to rise. And ultimately what happened in the 1940s, in the start of World War II, the global conflict breathed new life into the line. It built an extension to serve the Bell Bomber plant. It, and it went in as far as bringing in new streetcars to augment its service. And as we saw from the charts a moment ago, the ridership and revenues continued to increase. But despite the positive news and the positive outcomes that it might report, in some ways, the best days of the Atlanta Northern were already behind it. And to some degree, I think company officials knew that. They started discussing and entertaining options from different folks who were interested in buying the line. One of those potential suitors was the, the Seaboard Airline Railroad. Now, despite these conversations and back and forth discussions, there was no purchase of the line immediately. And the Atlanta Northern continued to operate on its own through World War II. But shortly after, in 1946, the railroad sold itself. It was purchased by a gentleman I mentioned a moment ago, J.C. Steinmetz. He was a bus promoter in the area and was responsible 
for a lot of coach lines in and around Atlanta, suburban coach lines. And once he bought the railroad, even if he initially said he wasn't going to just close it down immediately and convert it to bus operations, once he bought it, the end was near. It was really just a matter of when. And that when came at the end of January, 1947. The Marietta community turned out in droves to celebrate this line, and the city held a civic celebration to commemorate the line's history. And a bit of, of irony, perhaps, the new buses that would soon be replacing the streetcar lines were on display throughout the Marietta Square. And interestingly enough, on that final streetcar, which operated past midnight so into February of 1947, there were at least six riders who were on the very first run 42 years earlier. I found a quote from W.F. Edwards. He was the superintendent in charge of transportation. He spoke at the event, and I think he aptly summed up the history of the Atlanta Northern. And he said, for 42 years, the Marietta line has served you. I believe you will agree that it served you well. It helped a great deal to build Marietta and the other communities, especially in the early days. It was indispensable to your progress. During the war, it did its part in providing essential transportation for you and the bell bomber workers. Now it is outmoded and goes the way of everything that has passed its best days of usefulness. Well, that was the end, perhaps, of the Atlanta Northern. That's not the end of our story today. Well, certainly so much of the Atlanta Northern, its line and its infrastructure has been lost to time and modern development. There are still some remnants of the line that you can see today. In the bottom left here is a picture of Trolley Line Park off Atlanta Road in Vinings that commemorates a portion of the railroad's former right-of-way. Right above it is an office building in downtown Marietta at the intersection of Church and Hansel Streets. And that's actually the former railroad's car barn in Marietta. In the upper right is a picture of a rail that's a, a rail that's actually in use on the streetcar line in Smyrna. And you can go see it at the Smyrna History Museum in downtown Smyrna. And below it, which is now part of the King Plow Art Center, Arts District, is the former Ashby Street car barn of the Atlanta Northern. It's where they park the cars at night, and today it's an office building. I think there's some lofts in there as well. But as I put together, presentations, and in this one in particular, I started thinking about the legacy of the Atlanta Northern. It's a legacy that is similar to so many railroads throughout history. It's stories. The Atlanta Northern touched the lives of so many people during the four decades it operated. It helped people go about their daily lives. It gave mobility to communities up and down the line. In several instances, like the 1928 Jonesville tragedy I referenced at the start of my talk, the line forever changed the lives of families. Maybe the legacy of the Atlanta Northern is an opportunity for us. It's an opportunity to explore our past. History is a puzzle. The pieces are all there, but sometimes we only focus on one part of the puzzle. When we do, we fail to see the big picture. We fail to see how every part of the puzzle helps build the overall image we see when all the pieces are in place. I firmly believe the same is true for history. Our story today would not have been possible if not for the events of yesterday. And it's up to us to find those stories. It's up to us to take the time to open up the boxes in the state archives and look through the old records. We have the opportunity to find the stories from the past that speak to us, and we can bring them to life for a new generation. Stories are only forgotten because we've chosen to forget them. Or we can choose to explore them and consider how they help shape the communities we know today and the lessons that they might hold for tomorrow. 
with that, I'd be happy to take any questions from the audience. Okay, um, you had a quote on the people who were killed on the Atlanta Northern Railroad. Who, and it was kind of a harsh quote. Who gave that quote? I'm going to go back to it here. It is a very harsh quote. And it was written by a vice president of the Atlanta Northern to their insurance company. And ultimately what they did is there were a few lawsuits that were filed out of it. But in essence, what they did is, and these are the records that are here in the Georgia archives, they would go through and look at people's earnings and they would base how much they would pay each person who was either killed in the wreck or hurt in the wreck based on their earnings. And it was just, a, it was a very harsh, callous, cold way to look at it. And that's why I, I said a remark, something to the effect of it was the cost of doing business, which is very sad, but to some degree, it was just a literal cost that they had to pay out. I have a uh, comment here. Um, it says, I grew up along the abandoned line just north of the river across from Bolton. Interesting presentation. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Yeah. Um, Andrew Bramlett said, we enjoyed the presentation. Several months ago, I was researching a plan for a streetcar line from Atlanta to Marietta, and I found a reference to a 1916 anti-paralleling law that would ban railroads, including streetcars, from running near the route of the Western Atlantic. Would this law have been passed in response to the Atlanta Northern? And was the Atlanta Northern ever viewed as a serious competitor to the W and A? The first part of the question was that was more driven by the Louisville and Nashville which so the Western and Atlantic at that point in time was leased to the Nashville, Chattanooga and St. Louis, which was owned by the Louisville and Nashville. It's very confusing from a corporate history standpoint. Uh, state legislature was interested in, well, the Louisville and Nashville was considering building their own line down from Cartersville into Atlanta. Uh, the uh, state legislature and lawmakers at the time did not like that idea. They saw that as a direct threat to a great asset the state owned and didn't want anything to do with that. Um, it wasn't necessarily targeting, targeting this line. Uh, by 1916, this route had been around for a little more than a decade, it started in 1905. Uh, so it wouldn't have necessarily impacted uh, this particular line, but it was really more focused on the Louisville and Nashville Railroad. And I believe that that particular law made it to the um, state Supreme Court, if I'm not mistaken. And I believe they actually ultimately struck it down as unconstitutional from within the uh, uh, the state constitution, um, but it didn't ultimately matter in the sense of the Louisville and Nashville never proceeded with building their own line paralleling the uh, Western and Atlantic Road. Um, from a direct competition standpoint, um, probably some to a little bit. Um, there was probably a little bit. Um, I don't know. There was a, a huge. There was a huge threat. Um, while the Atlanta Northern, for example, did uh, move small amounts of freight. It was mostly passengers. So from the freight standpoint, it wouldn't have been viewed as a threat. It uh, might have been a little bit um, from the Western Atlantic point, but I didn't see much where they expressed much uh, dismay over it. And certainly I think from the Georgia Power and Railroad Railway Company standpoint, they saw it also as an opportunity to uh, build power up into some of these communities as well. Oh, we have a uh, comment here. Um, my grandfather ran a restaurant in Atlanta that served the rail car drivers. Um, let's see. Uh, Andrew says, I was looking back over my notes. The Marietta to Kennesaw Mountain streetcar was proposed twice, 1988 and 1916. It's, you know, it's, it's interesting when we talk about the idea of history repeating itself. Um, we're talking today, there's a lot more discussions about uh, when it comes to rail options, whether it's uh, you know heavy rail or light rail or streetcar lines, we're having we always have a, a, a modern streetcar in Atlanta that runs a, a small uh, way through downtown area. But we, we tend to revisit some of these same types of of um, mass transit options that we had once upon a time. And I gave a presentation earlier today, and I made a remark of something to the effect of, "Could you imagine being in Marietta or downtown Smyrna and hopping on the streetcar line and getting right downtown?" And between Marietta and Atlanta, it would take about 50 minutes, uh, just shy of an hour, 
And I think the initial fare was 35 cents. Um, might not be 35 cents today, but uh, with gas prices as they are, maybe hopping a streetcar wasn't such a bad option. <laughs> um, did the jitneys and buses fight back in 1925? They did. They did. There were a lot of, lot of, lot of legislation back and forth. Uh, the city council in Atlanta also passed some legislation of its own. Um, ultimately, the laws that were passed that were trying to bar the jitneys um, were ruled to be unconstitutional and, and did not stand up. Um, but yet there was a lot of legal back and forth on it. Uh, the jitneys did not take it easy. Uh, one thing that they actually said they were going to do at one point in time was they were all going to go out of business and start new businesses and call themselves taxis. So they could just apply for the taxi laws that were in place as a way to try to get around completely having to give up their business. Um, it was sort of a, an underhanded way they were gonna, gonna try to approach it. Um, it. It's funny though, I think when you look at the notion of a motor vehicle, uh, you know, we're always looking at technology. Think of our cars today, right? Our cars today are getting more technologically advanced. We're looking for, you know, whether it's an electric vehicle or whether it's self-driving vehicles, we're always looking for a better way to move. You could go back to the earliest days, right? We used to ride a horse. Well, we decided we should get trains at some point in time because we could go maybe a little bit faster on a train. And then we, we so we're always looking for better ways to be able to move from point A to point B. And so I think in the 1920s, even though we had, well, we had trains, then we would have streetcar lines within the city, then we would have Atlanta Northern, which was an inner urban, so we might run over streetcar tracks in part of town and it might run over a private right of way when it wasn't in town. Uh, but we were constantly looking for how could we get to the next best way to be able to commute from point A to point B. So ultimately, while maybe we had the streetcar and that was great in 1919, by 1925, well, we've got motor vehicles and that gives me a little bit more freedom to go about my way. And so I think we were always looking for new ways and the next best, greatest idea. Um, did having the Atlanta Northern Railroad come through communities help them to grow? And conversely, after they were no longer in existence, did those communities fail, some of them? They didn't necessarily fail. It certainly helped to grow. Um, and there was a lot within Smart is a great example of it. Um, in Mary, it's interesting because Atlanta and Marietta, the two ends of the line, uh, were probably a little bit uh, more standalone communities. Um, certainly Smyrna benefited greatly from the streetcar line, but even in what are really just today parts of Atlanta, Bolton is a great example. Uh, Hills Park is another community. We, we tend to think of today where Atlanta is, is it's always just been Atlanta, but Atlanta was used to just be a really small uh, piece of the overall Atlanta of today. Uh, so the downtown area and, and the downtown area of Marietta were maybe a little more separated and there wasn't the development all throughout, uh, but certainly it would help places like Smyrna grow and it would, uh, would definitely help that community expand. Um, I don't know that I would say they failed only because this entire area had really has been growing uh, since the World War II era. Now it's it's grown certainly at a higher uh, pace in the last last several years um, and has certainly filled in. I don't, there's almost today, if you drive between Atlanta and Marietta, there's basically no stopping of development. It's, it's near constant development the entire way. Um, so I, I wouldn't say it necessarily failed. It might have slowed their growth a little bit. I'd, I'd have to look into that a little bit deeper, to be honest. It's an interesting question, um, but definitely it helped them grow. And I think from a mobility standpoint, by the 1940s and, and the 1950s in particular, after the Atlanta Northern was there, there was a lot more bus operations. So there were certainly opportunities for people who didn't own vehicles themselves that they could still take some sort of public or, or mass transit option from Marietta or Smyrna into Atlanta. And then certainly once we start getting into the 60s and 70s, we have uh, interstates and vehicle ownership increase. Our, our mobility overall has probably increased. And that was one of the points um, I hope I made, I was trying to make about the, the notion of mobility. We tend to take it for granted today because it is generally so easy for us to get from point A to point B. And so many people uh, in particular in Atlanta own vehicles. And you know, if we want to buy something online, for example, right, we can buy it and comes to our house the next morning or comes overnight. So we don't even have to, we don't have to go anywhere, but the whole idea of we're able to get goods and services and, and ourselves as needed from point A to point B quickly, is something I think we just tend to not think about on a daily basis. As somebody say, interesting presentation. Um, this person's um, 
I'm a Marietta Tuni. I love to be able to walk. I'd love to be able to walk over and take a train to Atlanta. However, that option, that does not seem to be an option in the near future. Never, uh, what do they always say? You can never predict the future, um, I, I guess we could say, but I would say uh, not in the near term. It doesn't look like it'll be an option, but uh, yeah, if you, if you could imagine right downtown in Marietta, you could go right on the square and hop a trolley, or you could go right to where the train depot was and hop the Western and Atlantic. Um, during the uh, World War II years, um, were you able to look at some minutes? It seems like the board was really forward thinking and understanding that after World War II, things would not be going as well. So were you able to look at any um, minutes of I, those discussions? I didn't see minutes per se. There were a lot of letters though that were written back and forth and what they ultimately, and because the Atlanta Northern was owned by Georgia Power, whether a predecessor company or, or one iteration of Georgia Power, they would actually do a lot of surveys overall. Because in addition to the Atlanta Northern, what I didn't discuss is they had a streetcar network within Atlanta and they had another line that ran out to uh, Stone Mountain. And so they did a lot of studies of how could we increase ridership, really into, even in the 30s, I believe they started this work. And they were looking at how can we get more people to ride? And they looked at ways to reduce fare, whether they could run specials uh, and just a lot of research. They had an in-house researcher who did a lot of this work. Um, and there were a lot of plans too that the city of Atlanta was looking at um, just for how they could change mobility within the city of Atlanta. Um, so, but there were there was plenty of there's no shortage of discussion for how they might change that um, and and really what the outcome was going to be of it. And ultimately, you, you you could go very deep into some of these research and there were you know handwritten charts and all these are actually here on file at the Georgia Archives. Um, but ultimately, it, it was pretty clear the direction that it was going and the blips that you see in the ridership numbers and the revenue numbers were only going to be temporary. So I think they recognized the, the direction that it was going to be going. Um, where can your books be purchased? If you go to my website, railfanning.org, and you go to um, slash books, or you can actually go to slash store as well, um, you can get them from there. And I have uh, Western and Atlantic, I have other books as well, but uh, this one. Well, I don't think we have any more questions. Um, so thank you for a fascinating presentation. Glad to be here. And as a token of our appreciation, we have a vanishing Georgia book, which are photographs from all across you know, the state and we have um, these photographs in our virtual store and a magnet. Ah, fantastic. Thank you so much.